All right, so we're gonna jump right in with an, an overview of sort of the fundamentals about the MLC. So I'm gonna share some screens with you and then we will have a little bit of time for questions at the end. So let me go ahead now and share my screen. All right, and my, uh, my webinar queens will let me know if the visuals have not worked out quite right. So let's jump right on in, shall we? All right, so we're actually gonna start at sort of what I like to call the, the airplane level, the 40,000 foot level, if you will, um, up of, of where things stand, right? All, as opposed to way down at like the blade of grass level. So let's start up at the airplane level and work our way down. So at the highest level of everything, our fundamental purpose is to move money from the digital audio services that operate in the United States to move mechanical royalties from those services over to our members. And that's probably you, which is why you're probably joining us today. And we'll talk much more about who should become a member um, a bit later on in the presentation. So we sit in the middle of this revenue stream, this particular mechanical, which means audio stream of royalties from US digital audio services to the rights holders who are entitled to receive that money. Um, it's worth mentioning that we are the only party that can play this particular role in the stream of revenue. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit later about something that we call the blanket license. Um, and it's important to note now that we are the only party who can administer this brand new blanket license us and us alone. Um, and so really, um, for many of you, depending on the particular business situation that you have, um, either you're going to get paid by us directly, or somebody, some party that's supposed to pay you is going to get paid by us directly. Um, so, um, so let's now take it way down a few levels, um, so that this makes a lot more sense. So what we think is really important to do is start with the basics, um, because that's really important so that you understand how mechanical licensing works. That may not be something you're familiar with. So first, we need to make sure you understand the difference between a song or a composition and a recording. So um, under the copyright law, um, songs or compositions, I use those terms interchangeably, they are called musical works. And they are generally created by songwriters, composers, and lyricists and generally administered by music publishers, right? This is kind of what we consider the publishing side of the industry. Um, the copyright law actually defines this as the music, which is a melody, rhythm, or harmony that could be expressed in a system of notation. It could be actually drawn out with musical notes on a staff if you wanted to do that. Um, and the lyrics, if any. So a great example is the song Yesterday, which was co-written by John Lennon and Paul McCartney, hopefully two songwriters you've heard of. <clears throat> Let's contrast that with a recording. So copyright law calls these sound recordings, and these are generally created by recording artists and producers, and other musicians are involved. Um, they're usually distributed by, sometimes the copyright is even owned by record companies, um, and it's important to understand that a sound recording is not the same as what the copyright law calls an audiovisual work, which is another way of saying video. So in the music industry, it gets super complicated because you have these layers, these layers of copyrights involved. You have the underlying song, then you have a recording of that particular song. There might be lots of recordings of that song. Um, and then you also have potentially a music video of that recording of that song. So a good example of a recording, uh, the recording to song relationship, is that song yesterday, right? It was first recorded by the Beatles, but then it was recorded by numerous other artists after that, including Elvis Presley, Aretha Franklin, Frank Sinatra. Um, we call those cover records, cover versions. Um, in fact, yesterday is one of the most covered songs of all time in terms of the additional number of artists besides the Beatles who have recorded it. So you can see how you can have this sort of one to many relationship. One underlying song might be recorded by multiple artists, multiple recordings. Okay, so um, when you talk about copyright ownership of a musical work, what it means to own the copyright in musical work means that you basically have a set of exclusive rights. That's what it means to own a copyright. And the copyright law actually lays out a, a total of six rights, five of which really apply to musical works. But there's three that I just wanna highlight 
for right now because they, they, they are related to a particular kind of a license in the industry. So amongst those rights, the right to reproduce a musical work in a record, physical or digital, and the right to distribute, distribute that record physically or digitally, those rights combined, that's what we mean when we talk about a mechanical license the right to reproduce and distribute a musical work as a sound recording. That's what we mean by mechanical license. Um, another one you might have heard of, really, really important, is the public performance right, the right to publicly perform a work. And that involves a performance license, which is not the same as a mechanical license. There are other kinds of licenses involved in the music industry um, that involve other rights, like uh, the synchronization license involves a derivative right. So we won't get into an in-depth copyright discussion, um, but this is, uh, this is here to help you understand and differentiate a mechanical license from a performance license. Okay, so you might have heard of the Music Modernization Act landmark legislation, massive change to the US copyright law that affected music in a number of ways. The Music Modernization Act actually has three different titles under it. So there's three sections to the MMA, we call it the MMA. One of those sections is called the Musical Works Modernization Act. And it did four really important things that have a lot to do with the MLC. It created this brand new blanket license. Mechanical licensing before the MMA was always done on a work by work basis, which meant someone who needed to use the work, wanted to use the work, would have to go and ask each of the copyright owners of the work, one by one by one. We call that work by work licensing. The MMA created a blanket mechanical license for digital in the United States. Big difference, right? Um, it expanded the eligibility for this license. It gets a little complicated in terms of the law, but ultimately, nowadays, we see brand new songs being recorded for the first time ever that are made available on streaming services um, before they're ever made available like for a download or for a physical product. And they may never be. They may be released only as streams. Um, only to streaming platforms. And so the law had to be changed a bit to allow for that. Um, the law also mandated the creation of a publicly available database of musical works ownership information so that there was one central repository that others in the industry, everybody could look to to find out who owns this musical work. And it mandated the creation of a mechanical licensing collective to administer this blanket license and operate this database. And that's what has led to us. So let's talk a little bit about this blanket license um, because I think it's really important to understand what it does include, what it does not include. So the blanket license, this new thing created by the copyright law, it only applies to mechanicals, which means it only applies to audio. Video does not involve a mechanical. When we say the word mechanical, we're talking about audio. And it only applies to digital audio digital audio. And by that, I mean digital uses of audio, because I know most audio these days is recorded digitally, not on, in an analog form, but digital uses of that musical work. Um, and it only applies within the United States. This is the United States copyright law. Um, our law can only grant a license to things that happen in the United States. So what is included under this blanket license, the kinds of uses of musical works in sound recordings, um, interactive streams, um, that is, for example, services like Spotify, Apple Music, where you as a consumer, you get to decide exactly what you want to listen to. And, and you could play it on repeat 10 times if you want. You can go find your favorite song, listen to it on repeat, right? That's the example of an interactive streaming service. Um, limited or tethered downloads are, can fall under this blanket license. You may have encountered these and never even knew it. Um, depending on your particular music service you use, most of them have an option, like a button or a toggle, where you can opt to listen offline, sort of offline listening. So imagine you're on an airplane flying across the country, so you don't have a cell signal up there at 40,000 feet, and maybe you don't want to pay for Wi-Fi. So if before the flight took off, you set the option to um, have your playlist available for offline listening, the way that actually happens is that music is downloaded to your phone. Um, but you can't really play around with it or move it around. 
you don't have it forever the way you do with a permanent download, right? So that's the contrast between a limited or sometimes called tethered download versus a permanent download. Permanent downloads are those things that you probably bought from iTunes um, over the past, you know, more 10 plus years. So those kinds of uses of sound recordings that obviously embed musical works, those all can fall under the, the coverage of this blanket license. Some things that are not covered by this blanket license, anything to do with videos. This blanket license has nothing to do with video streaming, video download, video anything, not covered. Public performance, that's totally separate, right? This is a blanket mechanical license. And you remember from the prior slide, public performance is not mechanical. Those are separate. Um, this license only applies to digital uses. So this license is not used for obtaining a mechanical license to put out a CD or a vinyl record. So the way record companies get those licenses, that is not changing and this blanket license does not affect that. <clears throat> this has nothing to do with the use of lyrics, totally, completely separate, nothing to do with this blanket license. And something called a non-interactive stream also has nothing to do with this blanket license. So you remember when I described an interactive stream, you can go find your favorite track, play it on repeat. A non-interactive stream is the sort of thing you might encounter on um, Sirius XM or sort of the more, you know, the more traditional Pandora radio or iHeart radio, where you pick the station or the channel. Uh, you could pick your favorite artist's channel, and then you might hear your favorite song, um, but you might be waiting a while, right? So you might be able to do a thumbs up or a thumbs down. You might be able to skip, but you don't get to pick exactly what track you're going to listen to. So that's the difference between an interactive streaming service and a non-interactive streaming service. This stuff is crazy complicated, right? This is the music industry we live in. Um, but now that you, you are an insider, you're not just a consumer, you're an insider. And so you've got to learn the difference between interactive streaming and non-interactive streaming. All right, so I actually have a visual presentation of this sort of information for some of you guys that prefer an image to a bunch of text on a slide. So this is a recap of what we just talked about. So in this case, we're talking about musical works, the revenue rights uh, sort of royalty flow that goes back to musical works owners, not to sound recording owners. We're talking about musical works. Here we're talking about the audio, audio uses only, nothing to do with audio visual, right, which is another way of saying video. Nothing to do with public performance. We're talking about mechanicals. We're also talking only about digital mechanicals, not mechanicals that have to do with physical products. And then even within digital, we're talking about interactive streams and downloads, nothing to do with non-interactive streams that actually don't really um, include a mechanical at all, but they're just there to call out the fact that they do not fall within our scope. Um, it's also worth, again, remembering nothing to do with lyrics. Okay, so this is sort of a, um, a, a graphic version of the prior slide to help you understand the scope of this blanket license that the MLC now administers. So um, let's go over again some of those things the MLC does and make sure you understand what the MLC does not do. And the reason we do this is so that you understand the things we do not do you need to solve for those things, right? You don't wanna leave money on the table somewhere. So all the things that we do not do, it's really important that you understand what they are and that you find out how exactly you can go collect the money that you're entitled to. Um, Cause you don't, you don't wanna be missing out on money, right? So what will the MLC be doing, right? Or is already doing? Establishing and maintaining a public database. This is up and running. You can go to our website up in the top right corner. You'll see it says public Search. That is a publicly available database that is growing every day. We will be administering this new blanket compulsory mechanical license. And by the way, that term compulsory means that the license is granted by the law. Um, as a musical works owner, your work, once it becomes eligible for that blanket license, you can't opt out of it. Um, compulsory means the law grants the license. So it's a blanket compulsory mechanical license that's available to particular kinds of digital music providers, like those with interactive streaming, limited downloads, permanent downloads, operating in the United States, okay? We will collect U.S. digital mechanical royalties and sound recording usage data, like not just the money, but they also have to tell us how many streams happened, how many downloads happened, 
uh, we will be collecting that data and that money from digital services, which already began. We already began collecting that early this year. And we will be matching the data that they give to us with the data in our Musical Works ownership database. We will be making those matches and then distributing those royalties to the parties entitled to collect those royalties. So that's kind of what we're doing in a nutshell um, to contrast that with what we're not doing, right? So we are not replacing your performing rights organizations with respect to public performance. So if you are a writer out there or a publisher, you need to be affiliated with a performing rights organization like ASCAP or BMI, and there's several others, right? Um, you need to have a relationship with the PRO, and that is not changing at all, okay? We will not be replacing sound exchange in administering digital performance rights for sound recordings. So if you are also a uh, recording artist, um, or if you are a um, the party that owns the copyright in a sound recording, you need to join Sound Exchange. That's a separate revenue stream, nothing to do with us. You need to be a member of Sound Exchange and maybe also with us, totally different revenue streams, right? So collect your performance revenue, collect your Sound Exchange revenue if you're on the recording side, and sort out your mechanicals, right? Three separate revenue streams. Um, we will not be administering mechanical rights or collecting royalties for physical products. And so if your musical work is recorded and then that record is put out as a CD or a vinyl or any form of physical product, the mechanical licensing for process for that does not come through the MLC. We're not involved in that. We have nothing to do with the video or lyrics. So if your music is used in videos, there's lots of video services out there, right? YouTube, you know, TikTok, whatever, that does not run through us. The copyright law does not allow us um, to be involved in that revenue stream. So make sure that you have a solution in place so that you're not missing out on that revenue. Um, and we are not administering the license or collecting royalties from outside of the United States. So for example, Spotify in the US um, that has a blanket license and, and their revenue, the royalties from them flow to us. But Spotify in France, for example, um, we have nothing to do with Spotify in France. Spotify in France has to do a license with the mechanical rights organization in France, <laughs> who will then route the money in uh, all over the world. But that has nothing to do with us. And we're not allowed to collect those royalties for you. And that does mean that if you are expecting mechanicals from outside of the United States, you need to think about how you can collect that money as well. Again, right, the goal of us telling you what we don't do is to make sure you understand all these other revenue streams and you need to have a solution about how to collect that money. You don't want to leave any money on the table somewhere. Okay. So um, this is a slide. It can be a little scary at first. Don't worry. Let's start small. And by the way, it's on our website. Okay, it's, it's on there under our resources section. Um, and this is a, some like another way of kind of understanding where we fit into the digital music royalties landscape. So before you look at the whole thing, draw your attention to the top right corner. Okay, that's the key to understanding what everything else on the slide means. So the top right corner, um, what you see are three different kinds of digital uses, right? Um, down the left column, and you see which colors are involved, what kinds of royalty streams are involved with those different digital uses. And those correspond to these four color-coded columns, right? Yellow is public performance of musical works. Blue is reproduction distribution of musical works, mechanicals, right? And then on the right side, you have um, reproduction distribution for the recording, and you have digital performance rights for the recording. So um, because our session today is, is um, not super long, I'm not going to go through the rest of this slide. I wanted you to know that it is on the website. Um, and take your time to, you know, spend some time with it. It helps you understand these different revenue streams that may or may not affect you. And you can see the main takeaway right now is that you see the MLC is right there on the same sort of plat level, if you will, with the PROs, with sound exchange, with um, digital distribution companies and record companies for the sound recording side of things. So um, we're not replacing any of those parties. That's kind of the key takeaway from here. There's another image that's also on our website that you should definitely check out. It is also a, sort of at that 40,000 foot airplane level. Um, it gives you a very high level view of how the process works. Right. Um, and I'll quickly tell you that 
The process begins by people joining the MLC, by becoming a member of the MLC. More on that in a second. We call that connect to collect. That's our nifty catchphrase. It says connect to us to collect your royalties, okay? Once you become a member, you need to register your musical works data with us. We call that play your part, right? For us to know what to pay you on, we need to know what musical works you're entitled to collect royalties on. And as part of registering those musical works with us, we very much want you to also tell us about sound recordings that have been made of your musical works. That helps us get you paid. So all that stuff is done through our online portal. Um, while that's happening, on a monthly basis, we are getting data and mechanical royalties coming to us from the digital music services. So that data comes in, that money comes in on a monthly basis. Um, by the way, those royalties are what we call statutory royalties. The royalty rate is not something the MLC negotiates. It is set by um, a panel of judges called the Copyright Royalty Board or the CRB. They set that rate. Um, so then we bring in that data from the digital services. We bring in the data that our members have uh, registered with us, and we do this matching, this mixing up, connecting musical works and sound recordings. And where we're able to connect them, we then pay royalties to our members. And there's going to be some cases where we don't have that match, where we have not been able to make that match. Um, and this is something really exciting that the Music Modernization Act tackled straight on. Um, it calls for a greater degree of transparency than we've ever seen before in the industry. And so when we are not able to make that match, the, the ability to search sound recordings, find sound recordings of your musical works and match them to your musical works is something everyone will be able to do. The public will be able to see where there are sound recordings we've not been able to match and our members will be able to see that and our members will be able to claim those sound recordings and say, hey, that's a sound recording of my musical work. Um, and so this is, this is transformational because it puts the power in your hands to make sure that there are no sound recordings out there of your musical work that have somehow been missed um, and that you've not been paid for. So that's all also going to be available. Um, and again, this slide is on our website. You can spend as much time with it as you like. Um, it's on the how it works section of our website. I'm sure my webinar queens will post about that in the chat, um, but please do take some time. There's a, you know, a little bit of a paragraph next to each one of these um, six different items that helps explain it a little bit more. So who needs to become a member? I know you've been like, when is she gonna get to this already? Okay, so firstly, music publishers, publishing administrators, um, and you probably know if that applies to you, um, you, you kind of know, right? So music publishers, publishing administrators, and mechanical rights organizations based outside of the United States, um, in other countries, they all become members of the MLC. They need to become a member of the MLC if they are entitled to collect U.S. digital audio mechanicals from a licensee, for example, a digital music service. If they're entitled to collect that money, um, then they need to become members of the MLC. Um, but now let's tackle the thing that's even more confusing than that. Songwriters, composers, and lyricists. Some of you, some of you should become members of the MLC. Some of you will not become members of the MLC. It all has to do with your musical works. It all has to do with your musical works and who administers the publishing for those musical works. So if you are a songwriter, composer, or lyricist, and you administer the rights, you administer the publishing for even one of your musical works that has been recorded and is up on a digital service, you need to become a member of the MLC. If you administer even one work. Now, some of you might have done, like, let's say you record, you wrote 10 songs in, in the past, that are administered by a music publisher and you've written 10 songs since then that you administer, you still will join, but you will only register the works that you administer. And those first 10 works, let's say, that are with the music publisher, they will register those, right? And so songwriters really only join the MLC if they are basically acting as their own music publisher. That's what it means to self-administer. You are acting as the publisher. Um, and so if you administer even one of your musical works, you need to become a member of the NLC. If you don't administer any of your works, so let's say they're handled by a publisher 
or um, a publishing administrator, um, including a publishing administration service like um, Song Trust or um, I think maybe CD Baby Pro Publishing, right? Some of the digital aggregators have created a publishing administration service. If your musical works are administered by any of those kinds of organizations, you're not self-administered. <laughs> those works are not self-administered. They are administered by somebody else and that party will register them and collect the royalties and then pay you. But if you self-administer even one musical work that is being, you know, been released to a digital service, you should become a member of the MLC. And you don't join as a writer or a publisher. We don't have that, that kind of differentiation like performing rights organizations do. It works differently. For performing rights organizations, every songwriter needs to join one. And they join as either, uh, they will join as a writer and maybe also as a publisher if they self-publish. For the MLC, basically everybody is in that kind of publisher bucket. So if you are self-administered, you're going to just join the MLC as a member. There is no writer or publisher designation. You're going to simply join the MLC as a member and collect your royalties. Um, so lastly, um, and I know we only have a few minutes for questions, how do you become a member? You go to our website, top right corner, connect to collect. You'll be walked through a set of screens. Um, we'll have some, uh, there's lots of information on our website about how to navigate that. And we'll be doing some other sessions to explain that in more detail. Um, and if you get it all confused, you don't know how this works, you need some help, um, we have a lot of support available for you. You can contact us by phone, by email, by chat in the portal once you become a member. We um, provide service uh, 12 hours a day, Monday through Friday, as well as 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Central Time. So do not hesitate to reach out if you are at all confused or if you need some help. Also on our website, we have this whole resources section with FAQs and links to videos. Um, and we have the how it works section as well. So I really do invite you to check out our website and see you might find the answers to your questions there really easily. But if not, do not hesitate to contact us. We are here particularly for the purpose of helping you and helping you get paid. All right, so I'm coming out of screen share now. I realize we only have perhaps time for one or two questions. So I'm gonna take a quick uh, glance down them to see if there are any um, questions that I've seen asked multiple times. Um, so somebody asked if a service can be both interactive and non-interactive. So here's what I would say. Um, you might have one company that operates multiple services. For example, Pandora has a non-interactive service and they have an interactive service and they name them differently. Like one is just Pandora. I think the other might be Pandora Plus. Um, but generally the interaction with a particular recording is either interactive or non-interactive. Okay, um, the, uh, the detailed text of the blanket license, it doesn't quite work like sending out a license. Um, the license terms are actually written into section 115 of the copyright law, um, but you can on our website see which companies are now operating under the blanket license. There is a page on our website where you'll see the list of those services because they have to file a notice of license with us. Um, and so you can see which services specifically are operating under the blanket, but there isn't sort of like a one pager or something that lays out the terms. It's in the copyright law itself. Okay, um, so let's see what else I could tackle. Um, yes, some of the uh, question about do some of those publishing administration services, are they able to collect mechanicals outside of the United States? Yes, many of them do that. And that is why you may want to absolutely look into um, if you're expecting mechanicals from outside the United States, signing up with the publishing administration service might be the right way for you to go. Okay, so um, we are actually just about out of time. So, um, so I have to stop there. I'm really sorry. I know there was a couple questions that I did not get to. Please do check out our website. See if the answer is there. If it's not, do not hesitate to reach out to our customer experience team who'd be very happy to help you. So thank you for joining me. I hope this provided you with some great information and uh, I look forward to helping get you paid. Bye-bye.